what I want to do today is talk a little bit out of the message of uh, the Gospel of John. So if you will, please open your bulletins where that lesson is, and we're going to talk about that together. First of all, setting. The setting for this reading is the very end of the Last Supper. Right after all of this is done, Jesus and his disciples are going to leave the place where the Last Supper has happened, and they go to the Mount of Olives to pray. But right now, what Jesus is doing, and it started back in chapter 14, is that he's, in essence, giving them his kind of last will and testament. In other words, these are the really important things that I want to say to you that you absolutely should not forget. In fact, it's so important that when the Holy Spirit comes, and this is in the lesson, he will remind you of everything that I have told you. In other words, that's how important Jesus thinks these words are. And so... This is what I want to talk to you about. And so he has their attention. And you can tell if you read through these chapters, every time the disciples ask a question, the questions they're asking are explanatory. Now, Lord, how is this going to work? And, I mean, they're engaging. They, in other words, they get the momentous nature of what, in fact, is happening. They don't understand all that's going to go on on the crucifixion and resurrection. But there is something about the solemnity of the occasion. And of course, this is the Seder. It's the Last Supper. It's the most important celebration where the Jews gather together to remember how God delivered them from the nation of Egypt. So the celebration itself is of significant importance to them, even if Jesus didn't say a word. But he is using this occasion, this important solemn occasion, to tell them some very, very important things. Uh, where we are is that we actually have a kind of snippet in the middle of the conversation. And so we kind of pick up. Uh, and what Jesus is doing at this point is that he is talking to them about, okay, I'm leaving, but I'm not leaving you alone. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. And this is a little bit of where we are in the conversation that Jesus is talking about the ministry and the function of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian. How does this work? And so he's already said, just if you back up, I'm not going to leave you by yourself. I will not leave you orphans. This is before the lesson in your text. But he says, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And then he says, and then we pick up to where the lesson starts. He says, so he makes this comment, those who have my commands and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. And then Judas, not Iscariot, says, Lord, we don't understand how this works. How is it that you're going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? In other words, all they've known of Jesus is a physical presence that anybody with eyes can see. So in other words, how, Jesus, are you going to reveal yourself just to certain people, but not to others. Because you can't do that if you're a body. Everybody sees the body. But what Jesus is saying here is, no, no, no. This isn't going to be a physical presence. My Father is going to take the initiative and choose to reveal himself to the people that he decides. And the, the revelation, the ability to see, the revelation is not going to be something that you see with the physical eye. In fact, it's going to happen on the inside. You see, when the Holy Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit is not tangible. When the Holy Spirit comes, that he will do something new inside of you that will give you the ability to recognize God's hand at work. And that's what he's telling them here. Therefore, why is so? The importance of Jesus' command is, if I want to be where the Holy Spirit is revealing himself, if I want to discover what God is doing, then I have to, in essence, get on board. In other words, I have to be willing to say to God, God, I want to be a part of what it is that you're doing. I want to follow you. I want to obey your commandments. I want to come into your way. And Jesus says, if that's in your heart, I'm going to come and I'll show you everything you need to know. So in other words, what Jesus doesn't do by his Holy Spirit is choose to reveal himself and then we kind of get to, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. 
<laughs> no, he, instead what he does is that he does a work inside of our hearts to draw us to himself. Because as Jesus says earlier in the gospel, no one can come except the Holy Spirit draw them, the Father specifically. So there's already this work in our hearts where God is at work drawing us to himself. And then we have to come to the point of saying yes or no. Because we, in fact, can do either. And God holds us responsible for our choices. But if we say yes, if we say yes to him, what that does is that opens a door inside of us where the Holy Spirit can begin to reveal who he is, who Jesus is, and what he's doing. And that is incredibly important because if I want to be a follower of Jesus, I need to know what Jesus wants me to do. I need to know how I'm supposed to live. I need to know what to do, literally from day in and day out. And what the Holy Spirit will do once I'm in that place is that as he says in the text, he will teach me everything I need to know and, quote unquote, remind you, Jesus is saying, of everything that I said. In other words, what the Holy Spirit is not going to do is teach you things that are contrary to what Jesus has already revealed. There are plenty of people that say the Holy Spirit is telling them to do something. And you know what? It doesn't look like Jesus at all. And guess what? That is not the Holy Spirit. If it looks like Jesus, that's the Holy Spirit. If it doesn't look like Jesus, that's not the Holy Spirit. Because the second person of the Trinity in Jesus does not say things that are contrary to the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. And the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, doesn't say things that are in contradiction to what the second person of the Trinity has already said. Does that make sense to you? Nod your heads. Because this is important. You see, we live in a culture that is extraordinarily subjective. Well, I do what I feel. Even Christians fall into this trap when they say things like, well, you know, I just feel good about it. Part of me wants to go, so? Does it line up with what Jesus says or not? It's a far more important question than whether you feel, quote unquote, good about it or not. Because, what does it say in the scripture? The heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. In other words, I can convince myself of almost anything if I really try hard enough. Even if it is utterly wicked. So, isn't that true for you? Yes, of course it is. It's part of what it means to be human. None of us are different in that regard. So how does what I feel God is leading me to do line up with the teaching of Jesus? That's the question. Because the work of the Holy Spirit is always to teach me the things that I need to know and, in line, and remind me of the things that Jesus says. And the two are two sides of the same coin. In other words, because Holy Spirit and Jesus do not say things that are in contradiction to each other. They are one message. Because God speaks only with one voice. Only with one voice. So, we say yes to him. But the wonder of the Holy Spirit revealing that to us, it, it's not just informational, you see. It's actually a change of disposition. It's a change of heart. It's a change of direction. Those who love me, Jesus says. In other words, it's not just a question of this sort of wholeheartedly saying, yeah, I've got to fulfill the things that Jesus tells me to do. You know, you just can't do that. His commandments require courage, stamina, Discipline, obedience, passion, heartbreaking love for other people. You can't do the things that the Holy Spirit asks of you unless the Holy Spirit has you. In other words, for Jesus to do his work through you means he has to possess you. He has to own you. That's why in baptism we say, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God and marked what? As Christ's own forever. He owns you. And that puts you in the sphere where God can be at work in your life, where you can learn to say yes to him, because it's never about what I want. It's actually what Jesus wants for me, and I'm choosing to say yes to that. 
I don't get to make it up. Are you there? I don't get to make it up. In other words, it has everything to do with what's in here. And again, it's not just blindly following rules. It has to do with the heart. Jesus says, by this shall all know that you are my disciples. How? If you have love for one another. In other words, it's not merely the words of Jesus. It is actually the character of Jesus. The compassion of Jesus. The works of Jesus. So that when you pray, things begin to happen. All of that is the Holy Spirit working and operating with you. And you really can, if we're talking about the Holy Spirit, separate out any one of those. It, it, the works, the new heart, the obedience, the miracles, all of that are one piece. It's all one, because that's all that the Holy Spirit does. In fact, that's the other piece for what kind of you and I like to do. <laughs> we want to pick and choose. I'll say yes to this, but I don't feel very good about saying yes to that. Whether that comes into things like choosing to do things with our money that Jesus says we shouldn't do, or choosing to do things with our sex life that Jesus says that we shouldn't do, or choosing to do, believe things about God that actually are totally not true and have nothing to do with the life and image of Jesus. It is the, it is the nature of humanity to desire to stay in control of their lives. And in so doing, keeping Jesus... At, the, at a distance. And it's sheer folly. Because again, where is the Holy Spirit? He's not kind of out there. If we are a Christian, he's in here. So what we do when we make that kind of picking and choosing is that we literally create a fight inside of ourselves between our will and what we want and the Holy Spirit who will in fact fight against us if we're choosing to do things that he doesn't ask of us. Not because he's mean, but because he loves us. He doesn't want us to hurt ourselves and to enter into places of rebellion that can only produce bad fruit. He wants us to be men and women who are yielded to him so the Holy Spirit can flow through us in such a way as that it not only changes us, but it deeply touches the people around us so that we, in fact, become his servants, people who are willing to wash feet, People who are willing to go the second mile. People who are willing to give of what we have. People who are willing to make the time to serve even when it's inconvenient. Because that's the Holy Spirit's direction. Somebody said to me, you know, I have my list, but guess what? The Holy Spirit doesn't care a lot about my list. He just comes in and interrupts all the time. And it's the truth. Because that's how he operates. That's the work of God. Because what he's trying to do is make us like Jesus, who took off his robes, got down on his hands and knees, and washed the feet of his disciples. That is the high watermark of someone who belongs to Christ, who is that instrument of the Holy Spirit. People who are willing to so love, who have such a heartbreaking sense of compassion, that they just give without even any sense of personal cost. Because that's the very nature of God. God so loved the world that he did what? Yes. Oh, you can say it a louder than that. God so loved the world that he what? Yes. Right. See, and anyone who has the Holy Spirit within them and is at work with them, that's what they do. They give of their time, of their resources, they make room for people. They do the things that they wouldn't normally do. They make allowances for one another. They don't keep resentment. They learn to forgive. They're generous with their time because they're givers. It's more than just what you do with your money, although it certainly involves that. It has everything to do with an orientation. I'm here to give because God has given to me. And out of that flow comes the very work of the Holy Spirit because that's what he does. Even when he deals with people, when we deal with people who we don't like or who don't do what we want or... See, because that's how we treat God, isn't it? There's sometimes when we don't do what God likes us to do at all. We do things we, he doesn't like. But does that mean he decides, okay, I'm not going to talk to you anymore? No, he always hears us. 
That's why at the offertory, I don't know whether Father Bud uses this offertory invitation or not. I do it every Sunday. Walk in love, how? As Christ loved us. And what did he do? And gave himself up for us. To walk in that manner is to be one who is yielded to the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. So what Jesus is doing with his disciples is that he's talking about how God is going to be at work in their lives once he is resurrected and ascended into heaven. I would encourage you to take 14, 15, 16 in the chapter of John and just make it your prayer list. God, work that in me. Because that's what he is doing. And so here we are in this Easter season and we're saying to Jesus this morning, change my heart. Draw me more to you. Help me to be that vessel that you use in the lives of other people. Help my life to be an expression of the very servanthood of Jesus. Because that is what it means to be a Christian. Let us pray together. Lord, your words both convict us and draw us to you, as they should, because we are so keenly conscious of the places where we don't do what you ask. And yet you continue to encourage us and draw us to yourself. You forgive us. You are full of mercy and compassion. And so even this morning, we ask that you would work that mercy and that compassion in us in such a way as that you would help us love, give, and serve in a way that you continue to love and give to us. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen.